Who is he to say something like that to me? I can't believe he said that. I can't believe he went there. Who is he to tell me about how to be justified by grace through faith? I wasn't the one standing there giving approval to Stephen's death, one of the deacons we chose, but he was. I was with Jesus for three years. I saw him heal the sick. I saw him raise the dead. Yes, maybe the night before he died I had a little slip up. But I was there Sunday morning. I was at the empty tomb. And he reinstated me back into the ministry by the lake. He told me, Peter, feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. I was the one who stood up on Pentecost and gave that sermon and said, Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. I was there with John at the temple gate called Beautiful to heal that crippled beggar. Where was he? He was probably out plotting the church's demise, seeing how many more Christians he could kill. Who is he to talk to me like this? I suppose I need to take a breather and think a little bit about what I'm saying. The problem is, though, it's just been so tough. I'm just having a hard time wrapping my mind around everything that's gone on the past few years. It used to be pretty simple. Uh, you wanted to become a part of God's family? And if you weren't a child of Abraham, if you weren't an Israelite, then you get circumcised. You put yourself under Mosaic law. You keep all the festival days. You bring all the sacrifices. There were certain things you could see people do visibly with your eyes that showed you they were a part of God's family. But now, ever since Jesus left, everything's changing. And I just can't get over it, how these Gentiles can come into the church without having to do anything. And even my fellow Jews, to stay in the church and not have to do anything. I remember back not too long ago, I was in Joppa. And I was staying at the house of a man named Simon, who was a tanner. I was very hungry. And I kind of fell asleep. I kind of was in this daze. I had a trance. And I saw a big, basically, tablecloth come down out of the sky. And on this tablecloth, there were all sorts of different foods to eat. But you see, all the foods that were on there were things that God had told Moses we were not supposed to eat. They were, they were unclean foods. And then this voice comes from heaven and says, Get up, kill, and eat. Well, what do you mean? I would never do such a thing like that. I've never eaten anything unclean in my life. Why, Lord, would you tell me now to eat these things that you have told us for thousands of years we're not supposed to eat? And you know what God said to me? He said, don't call anything impure that I have made clean. And then it happened again. And then I had the dream a third time. And I woke up. And while this was all going on, uh, downstairs, some soldiers came from a centurion by the name of Cornelius. And they had been sent to, to find me. And even though in my head I was thinking to myself, it's unlawful for a Jew to associate with a Gentile, I figured, well, if God had sent them, I better go and see what's going on. So I went with them. And when I got to Cornelius's house, this Gentile sinner, he said how God had given him a vision too. And he called for me to come and they just wanted to hear what I had to say. Now, I might be thick-headed, but I'm not that thick-headed. I knew this was from God. And, and I said this, I now know how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And while I was talking, it was almost like Pentecost all over again. The Spirit of God came down. These Gentile people started speaking in tongues. They all were baptized on that day. And it's then I realized we'd been freed from the law. We had been unchained. That, that two-way covenant that God had made with Moses up on the mountain, that if you do all these things, then you will be my people and I will be your God, had been removed completely in Christ. And now it was just a one-way street of God saying, here's what I've done for you. And that's the end of the story. Well, that was then. And this is now. 
You, you see, I, I don't have a problem with the Gentiles. I really don't. When I was at Cornelius' house, I ate with them. I stayed with them. Uh, here in Antioch, I, I eat with them. I stay with them. But, but here's the problem. You see, I'm, I'm a preacher to the Jews, the circumcised. Paul, he's a preacher to the Gentiles. And, and the people I get to work with, well, they haven't seen the things I see. And they haven't heard some of the things I've heard. And some of them are pretty tough nuts to crack. And a group of my brothers came up from Jerusalem. And they just couldn't get over the fact that you didn't have to do anything to become a member of God's family. And they went around telling the Gentiles there that you do still have to be circumcised to enter into God's kingdom. Peer pressure. And you know what I should have done? I should have stood them and looked right in their faces and said, no, you don't. In Christ, all of those things have been done away with, but I didn't. I wavered, I fell, I faltered, I agreed with them, and I stopped eating with the Gentiles. I suppose it was good that Paul chewed me out. I suppose it was good that he put me in my place. Because basically, what message was I sending? By not eating with those people anymore? Wasn't I saying that what Christ had done for them isn't enough? That if they really wanted to be a part of God's family, then they have to do these things in order to make themselves right with God. And the minute you add anything to the work that Christ has already completed, you're taking away from grace. Paul said it right. If righteousness could be gained by the law, Christ died for nothing. And I know that's not true. I know he died for me. I know he died for everybody. And I compromised his word because I was afraid of what other people would think of me. Have you ever done that? Have you ever gone back to the law? I doubt I'm not the only one who's done it. It might be subtle. You may not even realize you're doing it, but well, even on the way here this morning, did you think to yourself, it's a pretty good thing I'm doing. I could be sleeping, I could be gone, I could be camping, but by golly, we're going to church because God says so. That's why we have to do it. Maybe on a communion Sunday, you really think, well, it's a communion Sunday, I really have to go this Sunday because those are the ones I, I really need to be at. The offering plate comes around, I, I have to throw something in, not joyfully, not regularly, not in keeping with your income, but I just do it because I'm supposed to do it. When life is going well, have you ever thought to yourself, I, I must be doing something right, that God continues to bless me and look down at me and smile, and I, I hope I just keep doing all these things that God wants me to do so my life goes smoothly. Or on the flip side, when things aren't going so well, have you ever thought to yourself, boy, what did I do wrong that God is so angry with me? What did I do that God is frowning on me and allowing me to suffer all these things? Do you see what the common denominator in all those statements are? I, 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 me, me, me. A very famous pastor who, if I said the name, everyone would probably have heard of him. At his 25th anniversary in the ministry uh, gala seminar they had, uh, made this quote. Today, I'm stepping across the line. I'm tired of waffling. I'm finished with wavering. I've made my choice. The verdict is in. My decision is irrevocable. I'm going God's way. There's no turning back now. I'll live the rest of my life serving God's purposes with God's people on God's planet. I will use my life to celebrate his presence, cultivate his character, participate in his family. I refuse to waste any more time on energy, on shallow living, petty thinking, trivial talking, thoughtless doing, hurtful resenting, or faithless worrying. Instead, I will magnify God grow to maturity, serve in ministry. Because this life is preparation for the next, I will value worship over wealth, we over me, character over comfort, service over status. I know what matters most. I'll give it all I got. I'll do the best I can with what I have for Jesus' sake today. I won't be captivated by culture, frustrated by problems, or intimidated by the devil. I'll run my race with my eyes on the goal, not on the sidelines or those running by. To my Savior Jesus Christ, I say, however, whenever, wherever, and whatever you ask me to do, my answer is yes. Wherever you lead, whatever the cost, I'm ready. There's some really good stuff in there, isn't there? I mean, those are some godly goals. 
some noble things to shoot for, but did you catch the common denominator in there? 31 times I or me, two times Jesus. Something's out of proportion there. Because what does Scripture say? I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Without him, doesn't Isaiah say, even all my righteous deeds are like filthy rags? In Ephesians 2, Paul said, for it's by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And the more I think about I and me, the more I take away from him. And what's bound to happen? You know, I, I make this commitment. I'm saying my life's going to change. I'm going to do all these things for the Lord. And if I'm not looking at Christ and instead looking at myself, what happens when I falter? What happens when I don't keep my end of the deal? What happens the days I don't do these things? Boy, don't you hang your head? You say, Lord, I, I, maybe I don't believe you enough. Maybe I don't trust you enough. Maybe I haven't prayed enough. Maybe I, maybe I, maybe I. Instead of like King David, throwing yourself at Jesus' feet and saying, Lord, have mercy on me. That's why it's so important that we remember what Paul said. We too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law. Because by observing the law, no one will be justified. For if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. And that's a powerful last statement. If I add anything, the smallest little thing to what Jesus has done for me, it can and does completely eliminate what Christ has done because grace is no longer grace. Even faith, even my faith, if I say to myself, well, all that Jesus has done could be mine, if I only believe it, Faith isn't a work. Faith isn't something I do. Even that's a gift of God. Of course, that doesn't mean you don't do anything, right? We've had this problem here in Antioch. They have this problem in other places where you hear the message of sins forgiven and this idea that you don't have to do anything to make yourself right with God and many take advantage of that and say, well, that's great, so I can do whatever I want and he'll forgive me. It's become a license to live my life however I want to live it. Well, Jesus told us often, a good tree bears good fruit. And a bad tree bears bad fruit. The question is, why am I doing it? What's my motive? In a perfect world, the kids wouldn't say in the morning, do we have to go to church today? And the parent wouldn't say, yes, you have to. Isn't that the law? In a perfect world, a child would say, what time are we leaving? I can't wait to go. I get one chance a week to come with my fellow believers and sing to Jesus and thank him for what he's done for me. When are we leaving? I don't have to. I want to. A good tree bears good fruit. And even the good works we do, Paul said in the 10th verse of Ephesians chapter 2, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God had prepared in advance for us to do. Even the good we do are things that God has set up for us from eternity. So it's good that Paul called me out. I was out of line. I was starting to add things back to the gospel which made the gospel no gospel at all. And that's why it's good we're together that you have each other to correct, rebuke when rebuking's needed, encourage when encouraging's needed. So do it. Don't give up meeting here together. Never stop appreciating just how free grace is. And don't let Satan ever bring a hint of the law between you and the way, the truth, and the life, your Savior Jesus. If I need correction, if it can happen to me, it can happen to anybody.